Hello, welcome back. Cloiso, Britain's Hidden History. Um, just doing some work, very pleasurable work, on the republishing of this truly monumental book by Wilson and Blackett, King Arthur Conspiracy. I've had so many helpers working on the text. I've got Peter Smith on the graphics. It gives me a chance to have a real think about the book and make some videos. So thank you, everyone concerned, for getting the work done. <laughs> right, now, one of the things I want to share immediately on Chapter 1 just something of interest here is about the works and I have the books in front of me got my own little covers on them but uh, you can see they are the original books Let's pull these off and this is uh, two volumes with maps ah, there's maps in there and things like that They're beautiful books I got these years ago in Hey on Why cost me 60 quid haggled him down from 65 <laughs> Um, and I, I, you can see all the notes I've made and everything, tons and tons of notes. I've thoroughly enjoyed reading the books. Uh, very interesting, beautifully written. And then you dig a bit deeper into them and you realise actually <laughs> it's all is not as it seems. And it's um, you, you kind of realise as you're reading it that it's normally not righteous. It's a bit of a load of nonsense, really. <laughs> so uh, let's share uh, something from chapter one. Where did that suddenly go? Here it is. Uh, you can see, uh, I'll just read this out here. So this is written, just to let you know, uh, Edwin Guest wrote it. Although, something I want to pick up on, which I think Wilson and Blackett didn't really pick up on enough. It was posthumously published um, by Bishop Studs. And what he says about it is interesting, which they do mention. So the Guest technique was basically very simple. First, discard all native British histories and records. And then second, trace every nation of Europe, including the British, back to the names of the Hebrew patriarchs descended from Noah in the biblical record. This was done by scouring the ancient Greek and Roman writings, they love their classics, for names of people and places, and then by comparing them and deciphering them. The result was a pompous proclamation of the inhabitants of Britain being, descended, uh, being the descendants of the biblical Gog and Magog. What's going on my highlighter here? Doing all sorts of weird things. Gog and Magog. That's who we are, if you're trying to keep up. No reason was given for discarding Cumric and British records. This buffoon was actually held in high repeat throughout Europe by sharing a bemused audience with myriads of ancient place names and tribal or city or identities, all quoted from a vast array of revered Greek and Latin writers, a vast illusory mirage of credibility was set up to support the newly invented British histories. Guests held that the name Britain derived Greek etymology and meant the painted men through Britanni. I've just got the old dictionaries out and looked it up. <laughs> Even that's a bit suspect. Brith, Brith is where he says it comes from. Uh, Brith doesn't mean painted, it means adorned. Or uh, Anyway, that's another point. Anyway, it seemed not to matter to him that Brutus was the founding king that Arab histories as late as 1100 AD were still referring to Britain as Brutus land. When he died, his political supporters, including Bishop Stubbs, gathered to publish the Origines Celtica, which is this big two-volume piece, which he had planned as the bogus history of Britain in total disregard of the fact there were no Celts in Britain, none of the British or Irish are Celtic, and there were no Celts in Britain. One of those eulogising guests in the preface of his work uh, signs himself as E.V., the preceptory Lincoln. Yep, it's in there. Referring to work of Edwin Guest, he states, It was one which afforded Dr. Guest the opportunity of exhibiting his marvellous genius as the discoverer, almost the creator, <laughs> of the early history of Britain. Anyone uh, who begins by totally setting aside and ignoring the entire corpus of national history without investigating it, and then labours to invent and create a new history based on speculation and surmise is hardly a genius. And then we come on to uh, Bishop Stubbs, who actually compiled this after he died. So he proclaims the work as one which bears so characteristic and impress of his genius, his faith and his devout labour. Here we have it. Everything had to conform to biblical record and myths of descendants of Noah and Abraham. British history did not conform, and neither did it suit the political requirements of the regime. In 1793, the identical nature of the British Colburn alphabet with ancient Etruscan and Pelasgian 
or Phrygian of Asia Minor was published. In 1846, John Williams of Oxford had published these alphabets and similarities. And by this time, Stubbs, by the time Stubbs is writing this, German scholars are investigating the British Cumric alphabet. This is one of the reasons why this book was so important and had to be published. Their research was going on. The links had been spotted between Welsh and the hieroglyphs and with Assyrian and Etruscan. Uh, you had von Bunsen in the 1840s from Prussia publishing that uh, all the, these Indo-European languages have an ancient common, ancient Assyrian source, which is uh, best seen in modern Welsh as the surviving fossil from that era that tells us all about it. So it's the same language uh, found in Geo Asian Mine and further east. Guest was just another classical scholar playing word games. This, however, however, was the treasury of the Blue Books. You can see the series on that and how British history was being deliberately and politically destroyed. I can read some more of that. Uh, the point why the language is so important in this book as well, because there in this book, the Arthur Conspiracy, is that it goes all through how you can learn about Colburn, how to read it. Same with Etruscan, uh, Phrygian, all this guy. It's all in the book. I've been working through it again. Fantastic. And I'm going to be putting more videos up, showing some examples. But what they couldn't get rid of was Arthur. <laughs> There's this King Arthur, like a rock in the middle of it. It's so much in British history. They couldn't get rid of it. So this is where a lot of this ridicule and, you know, making it into a myth and everything came from. So uh, it's, it's a fascinating book, actually. And I would like to... Um, there's one thing I was going to add to Wilson and Blackett, what he said about him. Uh, it's very much along the same sort of themes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of the, yes. An extra point I wanted to make. I've been reading through the what they call uh, prefatory notes again, going through the book. And what's fascinating and makes me even more suspicious about this book is that... Uh, all the things that Wilson and Blackett says are backed up. They did it by looking at names and words and things like that. But what this book makes very clear is that this was not a finished piece that he put together. He had a load of notes which they put together and they've really framed this book. Use his name, use his reputation. He hadn't published on this before. So they could more or less make this book as they wished it. And to me, that seems to be what's happened. And this happens a lot. The work of Edward Lloyd in that period, after he died, became the big thing. Gibbons, I've talked about before, I'll talk about again. So there seems to be this uh, using of reputations of people, even after they die, and take their notes to create the political message that you want. So, but it is, it is an entertaining book to read. Anyway, so more about, uh, but not as good as Wilson and Blackett. <laughs> and you know that's based on real history and records and something. All right, so very well soon. Till the next time, have a